Welcome to the DeFi Standard, and this is Mickey B. Fresh. In order to work as a bridge asset, XRP requires a market and liquidity of its own. Adoption and market-making conditions constitute a chicken and egg problem. For crypto assets, people will not use an asset until a market has developed around it. And such market will not develop if people do not use the asset. And they're explicitly talking about XRP and Ripple here. This is from the Ecology of Money and Money Infrastructures it talks about. So a primary market is typically considered when shares are issued of an equity and it's the initial distribution of that asset. Now, secondary markets have external trading. That's where you think of crypto exchanges. You think of NASDAQ trading through your broker. Secondary markets. The XRP ledger is a primary market, not because it trades its own asset on its own network. Because It's because the AMM, which is at the heart of the XRP Ledger's protocols and is one of the three trio that make up the underlying network's protocols. And it gives it its economic model. Issues ownership shares in each AMM pool. And we're going to discuss in this video why that is not just big, it's huge beyond. And this, over the long term, is so significant and we're going to dive into the CFA's Institute beyond hype of crypto assets and they say something about liquidity providing that this quote just speaks to exactly what is being built with these AMMs so client acquisition is key to a debt Determinant of success in DeFi and crypto, acquiring users and establishing a client base. DeFi and DLT enabled economic activities are fundamentally network based applications. Thus, how can a crypto asset service provider jumpstart a network and create interest and attract users? In general, the crypto industry has chosen to pay users to incentivize usage of their network, hence the development of yield farming activities. Yet, as client base develops, these crypto service providers will need to diversify away from a model that only attracts yield seekers. And this next quote, listen very carefully. This is from one of the most prestigious investment advisory firms in the world. The longer term strategic view of crypto probably lies instead in the idea that what users receive in return for providing liquidity is the acquisition of shares in a network that is developing this idea is related to the wider concept of a platform economy. Now, with the XRP Ledger's XLS30D AMMs, you're not getting a share on the network. You're getting a share in a money-making machine, literally. The AMM earns in three ways. And we could it's analogous to three specific market participants that you're all very familiar with. It earns trading fees the way an exchange or platform earns trading fees for every trade made. It earns the way an arbitrager arbitrages between markets from the burning of the LP tokens and the continuous auction mechanism. But it is the third way that is probably the one, that's the one that David Schwartz is the most excited about. 
That's the harvesting of volatility for yield and actually will drive value into the pool and increase its value. It actually makes offers on the XRP Ledger's Central Limit Order Book decks, and it earns a spread in the same way professional market makers earn on order books where they sit on the bid and they ask, and they buy high, sell low. They buy low, sell high. Buy low, sell high. Over and over and over again. And this is what the AMM does at the software code base level. It's built in to the policies of the code. There is no human element that impacts this. It's based on mathematics and a Fibonacci sequence of when to execute the trades. And it will only execute them on the central limit order book when it increases the value of the pool. This is in addition to the trading fees and the arbitrage. So you have three ways that are organically earning yield. And this will considerably and pretty much eliminate all impermanent loss over a period of time because it's a period of time that goes by where the pool is just earning. So these pools are going to be at the base layer. They're, that's why he's so excited about the supply side, the liquidity provisioning. Yes, it provides liquidity for ODL and for Liquidity Hub and for all the applications that we've built, non-financial applications, financial applications. They easily can tap into the order book, the AMM, and the payment execution engine. They're all one. So when it sends an offer through to our trade, it will route it then through the best path. But the AMM is set up so that it will get routed through them, through the pools, because the idea is to drive demand for people to provide liquidity. And liquidity is the lifeblood of any financial system. So the fact that the XRP ledger fees are lower is going to mean more of those mo that money that would go to arbitragers stays with the people who are staking the pool. And that's what you want, because you want you, if people don't stake the pool, there's no liquidity. You want the stakers to reap the rewards of their staking so that there will be these deep pools of liquidity. And the third feature is fairness. And then with the mechanism that we're working on that will allow them the pool to recapture much of the profits that the arbitrage uh, makes almost as if the pool were arbitraging against in itself, we're hopeful that that will incentivize very, very deep pools of liquidity on the XRP ledger that will make movement between tokens uh, very efficient. Um, so, XR so that could be, I think that could be a game changer. And one of the most significant issues DeFi and blockchain protocols will contend to with is to find a way to genuinely distribute and democratize economic value creation away from centralizing agents in favor of individuals. DLT applications to become mainstream, these services need to find a practical way to effectively transfer cash flows to the users of the tokens. Existing crypto asset service providers already are generating cash flows like exchanges, brokers, lending, borrowers. The challenge is what mechanisms are needed to transfer parts of this economic value back to token users. At its core, DeFi proposes to move economic value creation away from traditional intermediating agents, and it is not yet clear how the sector proposes to keep large financial institutions and big tech at bay, given their significant capital investments that are required to design and maintain a technological competitive advantage. Well, let me tell you that technological and competitive advantage is the XRP ledger was built to be a distributed exchange. And Ripple, in the meantime, has built RippleNet, an enterprise grade payment network that has or just using XRP for liquidity, it's an application outside of the network. So ODL does not fit into this bucket of native use cases on the network. It is not. So we're missing that. XRP has been missing its economic model. It's been missing yield. It's been missing storage demand. That's just transactional value. So that's why the price 
has not gone anywhere. It's not manipulated. It's just misunderstood. And it's a longer term vision. But we're now at that brink where we're going to get that economic model, that piece that drives the demand in and makes XRP be able to simultaneously be an investment, an investable asset that's yield bearing and then comes with lower volatility and a variety of ways that could be strategically positioned by different investors to utilize then that LP token, which is a ownership in the money making wealth machine and deploy that to hedge volatility downside, leverage up, borrow against, lend, do whatever. And that opens the door for a tremendous amount of opportunities. We've seen how staking on Ethereum and other networks has exploded with liquid staking derivatives. This is far more powerful. And the Ripple building the ODL and liquidity hub allows for that organic volume to run through the pools. No other network has organic volume running through it the way that ODL will and Liquidity Hub. Those are organic flows. They're not spec trading. And then the liquidity providing is not just spec trading of on order book exchanges. It's actually demand from investors of the asset who want to earn a yield and either want to use the asset as the NLP token, which means they don't have to sacrifice the opportunity cost to provide liquidity. They're able to still use that value. And that's what makes this so powerful. It's not just institutions using some asset. The value is in the protocol. And in this report, they say something else. And they go into the intrinsic value. In our view, intrinsic value of crypto assets is most logically related to analysis of use cases for these instruments or how participants are actually using them. This is if we are unable to use any form of discounted cash flow analysis to value crypto. There must be a suite of permanent users and usages that constitutes a bedrock of why crypto assets have value, at least for these users. And that's you, the community, as noted. Our premise in that the intrinsic value or floor value of crypto assets is related to the demand for such instruments at any point, understood as the sum of use cases for the instrument in question at a particular point. Our objective is to showcase a list of usage that may constitute it a permanent source of demand for crypto assets. They didn't say permanent source of utility. It's permanent source of demand. Utility does not drive price, which should be pretty obvious to everyone when you look at ODL. Just because something's using XRP, like something using it, that's not what we're looking for. So we need to change our way of thinking about things. Like when you see a project or something launching, like the Exology with the security settlement, just because it doesn't use XRP, that's okay. It's going to bring a whole new market participant into the ecosystem which is going to drive network effects. That's actually probably more powerful than it's just using XRP for just a transaction because it's going to create demand to hold the asset as an investable asset. It's going to complete, XRP is going to go through a complete change in how it's looked at as investable. Right now it has nothing. There's no yield. There's no reason why it should be $10. The asset itself is not where the value is. And in this they say one other thing that I thought was just, this really uh, was powerful. So the native token, and in, with the native token of an L1 blockchain, an intrinsic value is derived directly from its own underlying blockchain. What the native token draws from this network's pri network function as the primary is liquidity for XRP to facilitate cross-currency payments utilizing its native value exchange and payment execution engine, which is comprised of a trio of technologies. This 
is what's going to drive demand. And we keep hammering this point. Eventually, the rest of the community will see it. But it's very different than looking at like, oh, Bank of America is going to go to Coinbase and use XRP. That doesn't affect price. It'll have zero effect. It'll be quick, spec pump or whatever. But that's not the long term what we're looking for here. And just like Arthur Brito said, you're mission critical. The AMM pools are designed so everyone, anyone and everyone can provide liquidity through XRP. Now, if you go two assets and one's an issuer or an issued asset, you'll need a trust line to that issuer. That will be good for institutions and enterprises. And this is so flexible, but this is the long term way to generate sustainable revenue for the platform and the stakeholders on it. For those who are holding the assets, this is why he says harvesting the volatility for yield, because somebody could be holding XRP and they have USD, they put that in a pool, they're earning continuously, and now they have the LP token. They have now have less volatility, roughly a little less than 50% volatility risk to the downside, and then they could hedge further with the LP token and then withdraw at any point and use the XRP like they wanted to shoot off a payment into Corridor. That's why you don't need a price set. That's why you don't need a stable price. You use innovations and mechanism. It's not so simple as, oh, we just, the price is going to be this and needs to be stable. No, this is an innovative, complex industry with new technologies. That's what is going on here. And it's harvesting volatility for yield and a continuous auction mechanism. These will allow the liquidity providers, which is everyone holding XRP, and a permanent loss will probably be a non-issue over a period of time. But every pool will be individually different and will be have to valued and do your own research on of what the potential upside is. They will not all be equal. I'm just saying in general, this is a preparation. Now's the time to learn. Those who do will benefit greatly. Those who are thinking about price sets and burning of transaction fees are going to raise price. All this nonsense are going to get hit. And it's also going to have to learn really fast. And it's going to be difficult. It's complex stuff. This is not easy. And I, that's why I'm trying to prepare everyone early and not overload. But... This is it. He's so excited because he knows. Now I get to talk about my favorite subject, which is the AMM. I am unreasonably excited about this for largely personal reasons. I've spent a lot of time studying things like trading strategies and Forex markets, and this is near and dear to my heart. Um, I also learned something that I didn't know, which is um, as I watched automated market makers develop on other chains, I sort of thought that automated market makers were better than order books that like we implemented order books on the XRP ledger because it's sort of like the obvious thing. And then there's this really cool thing called an, called an automated market maker that most other like DeFi platforms are using, most other DEXs are using. And I learned as I looked into it that they're very complementary. They are not one or the other. One is not better than the other. They each have their own advantages and disadvantages. And the two of them together is way better than anything that you could get from having either one independently. And XLS30 is not just another AMM implementation. This was not the XRP ledger playing catch up. We were caught up with an order book. Um, this is a true innovation. The XRP ledger is a trusted and leading enabler of DeFi because the underlying architecture of the ledger combined with the protocol native design of the decentralized exchange and soon the AMM will address most of the pain points faced in the decentralized liquidity landscape today. The XRPL's DEX was launched in 2012, the first DEX in the world, tokenization of any asset, the ability to trade and move these tokens anywhere in the world in just seconds, and open, globally competitive liquidity. Now, adding AMM to that, AMM, first and foremost, as I think about it, most people think of an AMM, first and foremost, as providing liquidity. I think of it, first and foremost, as a trading engine. RippleX is focused on differentiating the world's first DEX through automated market making. The AMM specification is now on DevNet for testing, and it'll be available to vote on mainnet, I think just in a, in a couple of days. But ultimately, I see the AMM as a trading engine. It executes a trading strategy on behalf of the those people who sort of provide the liquidity. 
So as most of you probably know, an AMM has a pile of two assets and it makes markets between those two assets, but it's also implementing a trading strategy. The trading strategy profits from volatility, that is changes in the price of an asset. So if you think about assets that have very volatile prices, cryptocurrencies probably have the most volatile prices of any asset class like in human history, except maybe tulips in the 1400s. This is the thing that's going to drive continuous demand. It's not ODL. It's not liquidity hub. It's not XRP as a currency or reserve currency. Like everyone wants to think so big. It's not. It's right here on the network. The network has lacked an ecosystem. So we need that. And there'll be other use cases. But at its heart, it's getting the AMM. The challenge is what mechanisms are needed to transfer parts of the economic value back to token holders. At its core, DeFi proposes to move economic value creation away from traditional intermediates. So how are they going to do that? That's the way to do it, is to drive volume through these pools. And it's a very big value proposition. Also on here, demand for crypto assets and cryptocurrencies construed as money will depend on a variety of factors, one of which is the added benefits of these instruments offers to users. Layer one crypto assets are polymorphic assets, is the new asset class. It means it has characteristics of many asset classes and new. It's not a commodity, not a security, not a currency. It's all the above and more. And that's what's important to understand. And it needs to have to have an advantage. It needs to have native network. It needs to harness it. If it does not, that's why Glenn Hutchins, the values in the protocols, the XRP ledger's auto bridging, it's pathfinding, it's distributed exchange, it's escrow, all those things will provide its value. So as other XRPL chains launch, that's good because it's all part of the same ecosystem and it has the same reserve currency. It's different than EVM chains, which are just taking the smart contracts and building their own chain. It has nothing to do with ETH, the token. But XRPL protocol chains are going to be an ecosystem of them. And the future of crypto assets and their acceptance by the public as part of the mainstream economy will depend on the reality of these processes finding an efficient usage and distribution channel through tokenization. Lending and borrowing is another way to move money away from traditional financial intermediaries. This could become another source of permanent demand for crypto assets through the concept of total value of tokens that is locked. That's the key. We have zero right now. We need TVL. Liquidity in the pools will in, will constitute it. Le total value locked. Lending and borrowing next to it, total value locked. And that's what's going to drive the value up. Now, you might be saying, well, institutions aren't going to interact directly on the blockchain and on the network. They tried that once. Yes. This is what Prisma and RippleNet as a distribution platform are for, where there could be virtual pools that are on RippleNet that tap down into the underlying pools. But this is where the liquidity will always be. It's the pipelines, and these pools can get the deepest possible liquidity. Large value payments, XRP does not need to be a high price to handle large value payments because they can be broken up, and they will be broken up. Do I think XRP will have a high value price? Yes, over time, but it will take time. We're early and we're just scratching the surface. We have to go through this phase. There's no skipping this and the institutions need this and you believe that the institutions need this now. That's just made up fairy telling, storytelling. And we see a lot of YouTubers do that. And it's not, it's not right because this is the reality of it. The AMMs all involve you. You're going to be here a while, so kick it. Kick your shoes off, get comfortable, and generate wealth along the way. It's not just going to come from capital appreciation. That will be part of it. But if you look at any market, 
And the markets will change the cycles. They will not do this 80% up, 80% drop down. Because as demand for these assets come, it will provide a floor value. And it's not just ODL. Like ODL is going to jumpstart it. Ripple spent all that money and XRP that was sold to build RippleNet and then incentivize users on that to get ODL going. Why? So that it could pump all this volume through the network. That's a silver platter for us. For us. For anyone providing liquidity. Because Uniswap can't do that. SushiSwap can't do that. Only ODL can do that. And it takes a massive effort to build an enterprise payment network that would settle with a digital asset like XRP because it positions it now because you could provide liquidity that drives the demand. The transactional value and volume doesn't matter. It's not going to have any effect directly on the price. And as you see now, it doesn't. But it does drive demand for people to stake the pools. And that is the goal. And then you create these unique ways to do that. And earning yield is going to appeal to those institutions because it cuts down volatility. And this is why I get so adamantly mad when people say backing XRP with other assets because it is literally a slap in the face to the founders because this is where the value is. The intrinsic value is in the blockchain's protocols. You're going to put some piece of metal in a vault somewhere Who's going to pay for that, by the way, anyway? Nobody ever thinks about that when they say, well, back, gold, gold backed. Who's paying for the gold that's going to back it? It's the dumbest thing, anyway. And just that people fall for that is it's honestly, you know, sad. It's very sad because the value of the protocol is what you should be understanding is why you're here. And you won't be here long if you don't understand that because this is where the better networks are going to separate. This is an advantage for XRP in the long term because most networks have staking. And staking is driven by extracting value from the users. The AMMs do not have an operator. They do not have a cost associated with it. There's no fees that you have to pay to provide liquidity. It automatically takes all the profits and distributes them back to liquidity providers. And there's no human element. It's censorship resistant and immutable. That is it very important? And that is why the primary market will distribute these shares in the in the ownership of these pools. There's no regulations. There's no nothing can be done about anything. It's at the network layer. There's efforts of who? The code? That's it. That's why putting things at the blockchain layer are very powerful. I'm Mickey B. Fresh, and I'm out. The traditional intralegal financial territory was lost long ago to the political circus. So now we venture into a new territory that we've built extra legal and permissionless. Here in this new land, west of the old, we admit only a subservience to moral virtue, to mathematics, and to the awesome power of open, composable, immutable code. In our audacity, we build things and force them on no one. And we have invented, not just on the clean whiteboard of imagination, but in the dirty cauldron of real engineering, the world's first and only transparent, objective financial system for all mankind. We built it without a dollar of tax money, and we built it without permission. Consider what it means to be in opposition to this development, to be opposed to objective, transparent rule sets and voluntary association among consenting adults, to demand the compliance and submission of peaceful people at the point of a gun. Examine those who act like that, and you will discover where those enemies of humanity so pitifully lay. They are done ignoring us. They're certainly still, still laughing at us, and they've obviously started to fight us. But we will win, ethical arguments aside, because man is a capitalist creature, and capital flows where it is respected. Like water, it flows where it may. And as the permissions of the fiat system constrain and strangle, so our open, decentralized alternative stands ready to receive it. True innovation is messy, sometimes veering in unhelpful directions and back again. But capital will flow to well-ordered, decentralized finance as water flows indelibly to the sea, and both will happen naturally and both will happen without permission.
Thank you. So I was always of the mind that this system was going to be ripe for some kind of a disruption. Mm. And when I saw DeFi, I started to see where that disruption was going to come from. And I started to understand that this is going to be where it go. And what I've tried to tell people is what you need to understand about this new DeFi system is it will start in the third world and it will grow from there in the second world, third world, and then it will come here and completely flatten you. In the United States, I don't see us in any way being the leader in this. Oh, I, think, I think we are going to, it's going to be rammed down our throat is what it's going to be. And it just occurred to me that this is a brand new financial system hmm. and that this is going to replace the current C5 financial system. Thank you.